From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinion featured in JAMA. I'm Dr. Gregory Kerfman, the executive editor of JAMA. In this JAMA author interview, I'll be speaking with Dr. Scott Solomon and Dr. Senthil Selvaraj. Dr. Solomon is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the Clinical Trials Outcome Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Selvaraj is assistant professor of medicine in the Duke Molecular Physiology Institute and the Division of Cardiology at Duke University Medical Center. They are co-investigators on a study now published at the JAMA website titled Cardiovascular Burden of the V142I Transthyretin Variant. Thanks very much to both of you for joining us. Great to be here. Now, Dr. Solomon, the subject of your study was transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, a condition in which misfolded transthyretin protein is deposited in the heart muscle as amyloid and causes cardiac dysfunction. Can you please briefly explain for our listeners how transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis develops at a mechanistic level? Sure, and thanks so much, Greg, for having us on the podcast. As you know, transthyretin is a protein that is normally produced in the liver, as well as a few other places around the body. It's a carrier for thyroxin and retinal binding protein, um, which binds vitamin A. So transthyretin typically is a tetramer. It's, It's composed of four identical subunits, which are important in its stability and function, uh, but there are a number of mutations in transthyretin that can cause the protein to become unstable. There are two real types of transthyretin amyloidosis. One is due to genetic mutations in which the mutation itself causes the protein to misfold. And then there's wild type in which in the absence of mutation, the protein over time as people get older can also start to misfold. Now these misfolded transthyretin proteins, they aggregate into amyloid fibrils and they actually deposit in tissues such as the heart. The V142I, which also used to be called V122I, is a very common mutation leading to cardiomyopathy. As you'll hear, it's most common in people of African descent, and it is a mutation that results in the misfolding of the transthyretin and ultimately can lead to deposition of these amyloid proteins in the myocardium. Dr. Selvaraj, in your study, you provided clinical follow-up data on individuals who had the V142I transthyretin genetic variant who in most instances self-identify as black. Can you please tell our listeners what you found? Thanks so much again, Dr. Kerfman, and appreciate this opportunity. I first want to highlight the foundational data from several individual cohorts that we leveraged as well in our own study, Eric Women's Health Initiative and Regards. And so with the addition of MESA, we pulled these studies together to increase our power an ability to explore different angles of the natural history of carriers of the V142I variant. And so we first sought to provide more precise estimates of risk with the variant and evaluate the influence of age. And we found that carriers had an increased 10-year risk for heart failure hospitalization that started around the age of 63, which deeply augmented thereafter, while the 10-year risk for mortality increased around age 72. Now, this is earlier than previous analysis has found, which highlights the importance of pooling these different cohorts together for analysis. And with this larger sample size of our study, we were able to look at different types of heart failure. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as well as preserved ejection fraction, HEFREF and HEFPEF. Some may be surprised to see that the risk for heart failure was predominantly driven with a reduced ejection fraction, HEFREF, as most clinicians tie cardiac amyloid to HEFPEF. And I think this highlights the particularly aggressive nature of the disease with the reduction in injection fraction over time, and that once you are hospitalized for heart failure, this is really an advanced marker of disease. 
And I think this is particularly important as we think about patient populations to increase identification, coupled with the fact that some traditional therapies that we use in heart failure and in heart failure with reduced trajectory fraction in particular, that may not be as well tolerated in cardiac amyloid. And we also wanted to look at whether there are clinical modifiers of disease risk aside from age. So in particular, we were focused on sex as one potential modifier, and sex did not modify the association of the variant with worse outcomes, showing that men and women faced similar and substantial increased risk for heart failure and death. Now, the V142I transthyrene cardiac amyloid population has been more often reported in men than women in a lot of clinical studies, and so our analysis in this less selected patient population shows that the disease is likely underdiagnosed in women. And our final objective was to investigate the individual and population level cardiovascular burden of the variant. We found that carriers lived approximately two to two and a half years less than non-carriers, a finding that really surprisingly extended as far as almost age 85. And translating this finding to the population level, where the frequency of the variant, as Dr. Solomon noted, is roughly 3.4%, we show that 450,000 estimated carriers who are above the age of 50 who are currently living will collectively lose nearly 1 million years of life due to the variant. I think many in the amyloid community have recognized the potential large effect of the variant at the population level, but to our knowledge, these are the first more granular estimates of what the burden really looks like. I wonder if you could also please comment on what seems to be the complex interplay among the V142I genetic variant ancestry, the social construct of race, and social determinants of health in the condition of trans cardiac amyloidosis? You know, this is really such an important question and one that's challenging to do justice with currently available data. So I first want to highlight and refer some of the listeners of the podcast to a useful consensus report that was published last year by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that takes a deep dive into population descriptors, such as the social constructs of race and ethnicity and differentiating this from genetic ancestry. And so I want to make a few comments as they relate to this particular transthyrene variant. First, the geographic origin is West Africa, and therefore the variant, the disease, is most prevalent in those of West African descent. The variant, however, really has a global presence and is particularly common in parts of the United States in self-identified Black individuals. Now, the variant is not completely monomorphic in other races and ethnicities. For example, a much smaller percentage of self-identified white individuals are carriers, and this can be much more prevalent in those of Hispanic ethnicity. So this highlights some of the limitations of thinking about the variant purely in terms of race or ethnicity rather than genetic ancestry. And another example of how these concepts intersect is thinking about cardiovascular outcomes in cardiac amyloid. So for example, some data has shown that self-identified Black individuals who have cardiac amyloid, who may or may not have the variant, have more severe disease than white individuals. And this is after adjusting for a lot of potentially confounding conditions at the time of initial care. Now, this has raised the question of whether there are biological underpinnings for this observation. For example, whether there are differences in social determinants of health that might relate. So, for example, are we identifying individuals later in the disease process and referring them to clinical care when their disease may be more advanced? And so our analysis supports the importance of the variant in itself, leading to more advanced markers of the disease. But this really doesn't discount the importance of social determinants of health or comorbidities in thinking about an individual person's trajectory over time. And so extending these concepts just a little bit further, in our study, for example, we identified several comorbidities that portended similar relative risk to having the variant such as hypertension. Now, the variant is much less common in Black individuals than hypertension is, and therefore the population attributable fraction for hypertension is much greater than the variant. Similarly, the social determinants of health likely have a much greater impact at the population level of risk than the variant. This does not minimize the importance of the variant, but highlights that cardiovascular outcomes really have much more complex underpinnings. And so our team is really interested in trying to understand Why do some carriers progress toward disease while others appear to have a benign trajectory despite both being carriers? And we hope that future work can help us understand and disentangle these clinical, social, and genetic determinants of disease progression. Finally, Dr. Solomon, there are several new therapies for transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis that have been developed. And I wonder if you could please comment on them and how might the results of your study inform the timing of initiation of therapy? 
The good news is that for the first time, really, we have some options to treat these patients. And if you remember just a few years ago, we treated these patients with symptomatic and empiric therapy only. There were really no targeted therapies for transthyroid amyloidosis. Now, what we have learned over the past few years is, first of all, some of the guideline-directed medical therapies that we use already for heart failure are probably beneficial in patients with amyloid. However, these are from observational data. There are no real randomized trials of the same drugs that we typically use in heart failure, like SGLT2 inhibitors and mineralic corticoid receptor antagonists. We tend not to use many of the other neurohormonal agents typically. Currently, there are some targeted therapies, and the targeted therapies either try to stabilize the protein or knock the protein down. Those are two currently available types of therapies. So stabilizers are drugs like tefamidus, which is approved relatively recently over the last few years in the United States and other parts of the world that basically stabilize the protein. There are also silencers that can be either small interfering RNAs or oligonucleotides that knock it down. There's a trial currently going on, just started with a CRISPR-based gene therapy that essentially knocks out the gene and therefore reduces levels that way. And finally, there are therapies known as depleters that are antibodies that can basically target the amyloid that's in the heart. And those are just going into large trials right about now. But there's a lot of hope on the horizon for therapies that either are available available now or therapies that might be available in the future. Now, how do these data inform? For one thing, people are born with this mutation. And we know that the risk of having cardiomyopathy is relatively low in the younger years. So people are getting diagnosed potentially because they have a family member who has this, or it's being reported on Ancestry.com or 23andMe, and they want to know, well, what do I do about this at this point? I think what these data do is they give us a sense of when our patients who have this variant are at risk. And of course, at that point, it's a decision that has to be discussed between the patient and their physician, whether they start one of the available therapies or not. There's actually only one therapy so far that's been approved for cardiomyopathy in the United States, and that's the stabilizer to famitis, but that may change over the next few years. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Selfaraj and Dr. Solomon, for giving us your perspective on this very interesting research on transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. This JAMA author interview was produced by Shelley Steffens. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at geminetworkaudio.com. I'm Dr. Gregory Kerfman, and thanks for listening.